Hi, this is Governor Pete Ricketts, and welcome to the Nebraska Way. We're excited to welcome you to another episode of our podcast here where it's all about Nebraska. And today we've got a guest joining us, Dr. John Keene. And uh, John, I'm going to uh, read your bio here, okay? And then uh, we'll uh, get into the podcast here. So Dr. John Keene is a professor of biology and chair of the Department of uh, and chair of the department at the Hastings at Hastings College. He's co-chair of Smart Approaches to Marijuana Nebraska, an organization that envisions a society where marijuana policies are aligned with scientific understanding of marijuana's harms. That's a good thing. And Dr. Keene has earned a bachelor's degree in biology from Hastings College and his doctor of veterinary medicine degree from Kansas State University. At Hastings College, uh, he holds the McIntyre Distinguished Professorship in Biological Sciences received the Von Drack Outstanding Advisory Award for Excellence in Academic a um, Advising and was chosen as an Artist Lecture Series. Artist Lecture Series, really? Artist Lecture Series? Mm -hmm, you okay, bet. wow, you are quite the Renaissance man. Uh, lecture Series Invited Faculty Lecturer. He is also a former member of the Nebraska Legislature representing District 38. Uh, uh, John's scientific interests include mammalian physiology, reproductive endocrinology, I don't even know what that means, and I was a biology major, uh, population medicine, and public health. All right, great, so John, why don't we just start, tell us a little bit about your background, we, I mean, we kind of hit some of the bio lines here, but just talk to us a little bit about uh, kind of growing up and where you grew up and how you ended up in uh, veterinary medicine. You bet, thank you, Governor. Um, it's a, a real opportunity for me to be here with you uh, this morning and, and visit with you about the, the medical marijuana issue. Oh, slow down, uh, I didn't ask about that yet. Oh, no, no we're I not even medical background marijuana. first. Just tell us right. about your background okay, first. Okay, gotcha. Just relax, don't jump in right away. <laughs> uh, my background, uh, I uh, grew up in Hartwell, Nebraska. I am the fourth generation of John Keene to be born on the, within the, the same area in Kearney County. Uh, so deep roots in South Central Nebraska, I graduated at Minden High School. Um, always wanted to be a veterinarian from the, the time I can remember. Oh, I was cool. uh, the, the kid that was scraping roadkill off a highway <laughs> and dissecting it. And, uh, um, is that a real story? That is true, yes. Uh, right. my, my mom taught me how to suture hernias on pigs with a needle and thread when I was still in elementary school. And uh, from then on, it was all about uh, science and, and medicine and that kind of sense of curiosity. So uh, kind of typical small town high so school. So when you nerd. started at Hastings College, you knew you were gonna be a biology major, you knew you were gonna study veterinary medicine. Did you go straight from that you graduated from Hastings then straight to Kansas State? Yep, absolutely. It was a, a direct path, never any waiver or uh, looked at other options, but always came right back to uh, science and, and veterinary medicine, particularly because the the clinical approach to veterinary medicine is very different than uh, an MD. Um, you know what you call a veterinarian who specializes in only one species. What's that? A physician. A physician, uh, a doctor. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, uh, the, the approach of, joke, of diagnostics <laughs> and uh, uh, really looking at evidence based medicine and population medicine that's in, in the veterinary approach always really appealed to me. And so uh, it was uh, the path that I'd wanted to do my entire life and it was a really great opportunity to be able to, to pursue that academic training. And okay, and career. so when you graduate from Kansas State, you come straight back to Nebraska, start practicing? Uh, came back to Nebraska, started in a, a group practice in um, Hastings, Nebraska, a seven doctor mixed animal practice where I did equine and, and population medicine. Um, moved in and opened my own practice in 2004. Um, simultaneously, when I came back, started teaching a night course um, in anatomy at Hastings College, which was my alma mater. Uh, former uh, dean gave me a call and, and they'd had an adjunct who had resigned and so asked me to step in and see if I could uh, teach a class and uh, just grew from there. And by the time uh, 2004 rolled around, I was uh, hired as a full-time uh, tenure track faculty member. And, so you're uh, a faculty forward. member, mm -hmm. you're a veterinarian, mm -hmm. Still involved in production agriculture? Yep, raise, and raise cows and, and cattle, um, show pigs uh, as well, and chickens that we won't talk about. First rule of chicken club is never talk about how many chickens you have. Okay, thanks. I wasn't <laughs> going to ask, but okay, thanks. So, okay, so again, uh, how did you get then? Because so lots of stuff there we talked right. about, you know, with regard to your background, but also you've gotten involved in public policy. You bet. So how did that all come about? Uh, my public policy work uh, just started in, in local uh, community government, served on the board of uh, a local public power district, and then ultimately culminated in 2004. 
14 in running for uh, District 38 in the Nebraska legislature, representing uh, my seven home counties in, in South Central Nebraska. And that's really where I, I got the most involved directly in the policy issues, especially those uh, surrounding um, uh, prescription drugs, healthcare policy. I worked a lot with uh, Nebraska's pr prescription drug monitoring program legislation. We were um, one of the first in the nations with that, right? Yep, to, you bet. Yep. Um, uh, really a, a leading innovative uh, um, issue there. I was very involved in public policy around opioids. I was going to say that's one of the, our prescription drug, prescription drug monitoring program is one of the things that's helped us control the opioid ap 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 epidemic here in Nebraska versus what's happened in some other states. Correct. Yeah, the the PDMP is a piece of legislation That's an easy and way to policy. Say it, yeah, PDMP. <laughs> the PDMP. <laughs> uh, it, it really is innovative in, in not only its role in combating um, the opioid issue, which is what a lot of PDMPs were, were built in response to, but Nebraska's PDMP also um, includes all prescription drugs. So it's a really innovative tool for right. healthcare delivery. It's a great way to find um, patients who are doctor shopping. Great way bet. to find doctors who may be over prescribing. Yep, as well as uh, patients who may have drug interactions, and that's one of the, the right. Right. key issues um, and, and this very valuable system to en enhance and improve the quality of health care in Nebraska. So I uh, worked with PDMP, worked uh, with biosimilars legislation as well um, on the policy side. And, and it was here that I, I first uh, encountered the medical marijuana issue as a policy as it was a bill that was brought before the legislature um, during my time serving as a state senator. Right. So that's how kind of this all kind of because you've got and you've got a, a, a great background um, really diverse background when you're talking about medicine, you're talking about academics, you're talking mm -hmm. about public policy, and that all kind of came together uh, here around this marijuana issue that was introduced. Yeah. So ta let's talk a little bit about that. What, uh, first of all, what was the bill that was introduced in the legislature and you know what started raising your concerns about this, the, the bill that was introduced? Yeah, the, the first time I encountered medical marijuana legislation, um, I hadn't been particularly passionate one way or the other about it, um, but as I started looking into what it meant for public policy, um, I became very concerned. There, we have collectively bought into a myth of marijuana as medicine, and it's been a very effective talking point to promote the commercialization of THC and promote legalization of marijuana. So maybe you should say, what, what's T, describe what THC is. Yeah, so THC is the, the psychoactive compound that is in marijuana. So THC, can you actually spell it, uh, say the word out? Tetrahydrocannabinol. Oh, I knew um, you could. Good uh, job, John. <laughs> which is, uh, the other compound uh, is CBD, which is cannabidiol, which is uh, the one that is, uh, um, commercially available in an FDA approved form called Epidiolex, which has been tested for um, seizure control for some forms of In fact, the state of Nebraska seizures. actually helped fund some of that research, yeah, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, UNMC had a, um, a compassionate use study which looked at uh, utilizing Epidiolex in, in juvenile um, patients. So uh, the, the issues around marijuana as medicine and that mythology um, really came to my eye because one of the issues I work a lot with with students uh, is issues of informed consent and evidence-based medicine. So informed consent in a healthcare setting, ensuring that um, patients have a clear communication with their physician and their healthcare provider to know what both the risks and benefits are, um, as well as uh, understanding clearly that decisions made in a healthcare setting are made with, with evidence. So, okay, so, because uh, those are two really key things, because isn't that the whole point of the FDA, right? Correct. I mean, isn't that what the Food and Drug Administration they have a whole process for how drugs get approved of for public use. Um, you know, we talked about the Epidiolex or, you know, and how that went through the FDA process. But it's to make sure drugs are safe and effective to know what they're supposed to be used for, what the unintended side effects are. The unintended, you know, the, the side effects for every drug have side effects, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, what dosage you use it in and, you know, all that sort of stuff so that patients can make that and patients and doctors can make that decision about you know how to use a drug and how to you know and mm -hmm. what the risks are because if you take one drug you may be taking a you're taking a risk on someplace else so we've we've bought into this idea as you said about marijuana being medicine but marijuana has never gone through this process right correct and, and it's an interesting uh chicken and the egg scenario where uh marijuana has been promoted as medicine and medicine can't be harmful and if something's harmful it certainly can't be medicine so by creating and perpetuating the idea that marijuana is available to be uh, used for treating a wide variety of conditions um, over the years, very few of which have had any clinical evidence whatsoever of their efficacy. Um, it's created a, an idea and an aura of safety um, around the 
use of marijuana, even recreationally. And it's been that changing attitude about marijuana, particularly with regard to its harmfulness in, in youth and adolescence, which really initially caught my attention. Um, as a clinician... So, okay, so just before, I, I want to, yeah. because I want to get into some of the, the stuff on the clinical side, but just how did we get here? How, how did it get to be that people started saying marijuana is uh, a medicine? Because, like, at least when I was young, nobody thought marijuana was a medicine, right? When people were smoking marijuana, it's because they wanted to get high. Right. Right. Ballot issue in California is where is, is the history in terms of the, the legislative history. But throughout the 70s, there was a, a movement again towards marijuana legalization as part of a broader uh, legalization movement for um, drugs and drug use in general. Um, what really stuck as a message was that consumers, voters, uh, patients, um, were not particularly buying into the idea of rec recreational use of marijuana, but appealing to our general idea and concept of compassion for people who are ill, um, the application of marijuana in, in a couple of very limited scenarios, uh, specifically um, cachexia associated with cancer patients, um, as well as some spasticity with some severe neurologic diseases like multiple sclerosis. There so was, you're talking about people have seizures. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. limited. I hate to translate for people, but sometimes we have to yeah, do that for you, uh, apparently. <laughs> limited, uh, limited levels. Remember, of, most of our listeners are not actually going to be doctors or veterans. Areas, just so you know. Well, that's that's uh, that's true. That's good. <laughs> uh, and, and unfortunately, it is it is exactly yeah. that lack of, of knowledge of, about the medical well, process right, that has been capitalized on. Right. Um, so uh, the the idea that. Uh, Everyone that has an, a family member, a friend, a person in their community who suffered from uh, a cancer, but we can all uh, see another the chronic disease, right. right? So we see the suffering, and, and our compassion leads us to want to to reach out and give them opportunities to relieve that that pain and suffering. Unfortunately, uh, what that level of compassion has done has allowed. Uh, commercialization of, of marijuana and, and marijuana legalization advocates to really play upon that sense of compassion and uh, portray marijuana as, as harmless. Um, in many cases, portray it as beneficial. Um, and, and but it's just not true. It, it's not true. Um, yeah. uh, the evidence does not support that. So speaking of that, because uh, I think uh, our U.S. Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, actually weighed in mm -hmm. on this recently. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you're talking about, again, the marijuana industry, and we want to get Correct. into this too, it's an industry, right? right? It's a big industry, yep. just like other big industries. But, but uh, our U.S. Surgeon General's weighed in, this, uh, weighed in on this recently. Yeah, uh, Jerome Adams, U.S. Surgeon General, so our, our chief medical officer in the country, um, has been very explicit in saying there is no such thing as medical marijuana, meaning that marijuana smoked recreationally for the purposes of getting high um, is indistinguishable and is no different than marijuana that is advocated for, for use for medical purposes. And he's been very uh, cautious about um, encouraging people to take a step back at this normalization of, of marijuana and what its ultimate impacts are on the public health and safety of uh, the country. And it, it boils down to even how marijuana is uh, utilized and how it fits into a, a doctor-patient relationship. And it's one of the things I found the most uh, eye-opening when I talked to Nebraskans about medical marijuana and the marijuana issue. And it's the, the misperception that there is a, a prescription involved in this doctor-patient relationship. Right. So, um, well, I mean, because I mean, there's no medical association that would say you can actually deliver any drug marijuana or Correct. anything else by smoking it because you can't control the dosage, right? Correct. I mean, just, there's a basic thing right there that's like, well, that's a fallacy right there. It's not a drug because it's not a medical, it's not a medicine because you can't actually deliver medicine by smoking it. Right, yeah, and our traditional idea of drugs are uh, a single compound or a single biological that's in a, a controlled uh, concentration, a controlled dosage, and a controlled administration. That's not what's happening with, with marijuana. Uh, you can go everywhere from smoking it to edibles, which are, are highly concentrated, uh, uh, to baking it in a wide variety of goods, uh, to things like shatter and, and shake and other um, highly processed forms of, of highly concentrated THC. Each of those is going to have a, a variable impact and in interaction with the person taking it. Um, it's highly dependent upon the conditions in which it was grown and it's, it's completely unpredictable. We would never encourage a patient to go out and uh, plant some willow trees and say, okay, now medicate your headaches by stripping off the bark as it comes. It's, right. a, it's a ludicrous idea. Um, but for uh, 
whatever reason, the idea. So the bark of, willow trees actually be used for medicine? Well, that's what salicylic acid, which is aspirin, it actually oh, comes from. Oh, okay, well, yeah, there you go. There so, you go. There you go. A little fun fact right, of the yeah. day. Um, so uh, the, the idea that we are going to have this uncontrolled uh, medication process where the doctor is really peripheral. So the, the doctor's only role in a medical marijuana relationship with a patient is signing a card for an authorizing condition. So they're not actually overseeing right. the dosage, the route, the administration. That's all handled in the, the dispensary by untrained individuals and not by, by medical practitioners, pharmacists, physicians. Is there any other the drug that's like this? Is there any place else where we do something where we just say, okay, yeah, it's a dangerous drug, but you know, don't worry about it. You, it's, somebody who's untrained will actually be able to give you it. Not even close. Yeah, yeah. There, there isn't anything in the history of uh, U.S. medical establishment um, or medical practice that is uh, that far out of the parameters of standard-based doctor-patient relationship, safety and efficacy. And the first step in, in the FDA approval process is f proving first that it's safe and the second that it's, it's efficacious. Um, this is, completely bypasses those normal patient and public health uh, safety regulations. Right. So we've, we've kind of established that this, there's no clinical research that shows that smoking marijuana actually is medical at all, and it's certainly not being treated like any other medicine, so it's really not medicine. There's no such thing, the Surgeon General says there's you know, no such thing as medical marijuana, it's just a, it's a myth. But it actually is harmful, right? There's research that's showing that is, it not only is it not helpful, it's actually harmful. You bet, and in a number of different ways. So. Um, the one thing that we do know definitively is marijuana's impact on the developing brain. So there, there's a lot of research that has suggestive potential effects, that has suggestive outcomes. The definitive uh, area of research of, of marijuana is what the drug itself, especially at high potency, at high frequency, and um, uh, regular use, does to the developing brain. And, and that's really where we are conducting. When you say developing, you're talking about like young people's brains as kids. A, to you like bet. kids to like how old? Uh, is like how long is your as your if you're like a guy, how long is your brain developing? Yeah. Right? I know women would say <laughs> all your life your brain is developing. You never quite get there, but. Yeah, when yeah. the physiologic maturity is going to be about 18 to 21, but we know that in some cases the, the brain is still developing into the early 20s, as, as we've seen with uh, additional research in brain development. But from the moment the neurologic system begins to develop, um, the impact of THC on, on those systems um, in cases can be irreversible. And when you look at, at so one... So if you're a kid and you're smoking marijuana, you're actually going to be harming your ability, you know, reducing your IQ, harming your cognitive ability. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, yes, but also not just uh, children uh, self-administering marijuana, whether it's by smoking or edibles, but it's accidental exposure. It's secondhand exposure in the home. Um, it's exposure in utero. In, in California, one... So in you're telling me that if, I'm, if a woman's pregnant and she's smoking marijuana, that could be harming the brain function of her child? Not only harming... In the womb? Yeah, not only harming the brain function of the child. Um, one in five uh, pregnant women in California have reported smoking marijuana while they're pregnant. And the one definitive case... Don't we say it's bad for pregnant women to smoke <laughs> cigarettes? <laughs> Correct. Tell them not to do that and tell them not to drink when there's, right, Correct. too. And now we're, there's one in 20% of women in, in California are smoking marijuana. You, you can actually pregnant? find uh, blogs and, and television commentators which will recommend marijuana use for women during pregnancy. This sounds like the, the old ads when the cigarette manufacturers were recommending smoking to help your digestion. It, it is. We have, we have not learned. Not telling you that it was giving you past. lung cancer and yeah. going to kill you. Yeah. Right? Probably the most tragic case is one that was actually reported in January of this year, and it's the case case of an 11 day old little girl who died from marijuana exposure in utero. Um, oh, she geez. was uh, suffered from necrosis of her liver and adrenal glands, which means her internal organs um, liquefied and internally. So it wasn't just her brain? No, it was it was her uh, organs itself. How did they, how they, how did they determine that it was exposure to marijuana? Um, you know, the case report is really interesting because it's the first that excluded all other potential cases of uh, causes of death in that 11-day-old little girl. And it's not the first report of, of children um, dying as a result of exposure to marijuana. Um, as far back as 2017, uh, an 11-year-old uh, little boy died of uh, cardiac complications of something that is seen in adult drug users. Um, uh, 
uh, chronic and habitual marijuana users that causes impacts on the muscle of the heart. And this 11-year-old, through accidental exposure, um, ingested uh, enough um, uh, THC uh, initially Was it candy or something uh, like that in the form of edibles. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> accidental ingestion led to seizures, which then led to cardiovascular collapse and, and a, a acute cardiac arrest. So um, the mythology that uh, no one's ever died from marijuana use uh, is directly contradicted in, That's in not case true. reports. So it's people not have true. died because of marijuana. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the other aspect of, of death from marijuana is how we account for those deaths, which how we how we talk about marijuana injury and marijuana harm compared to harm from other substances like alcohol or smoking um, is completely different. So um, if you were to... Um, be involved in a car accident while you're under the influence of alcohol and uh, you killed another uh, driver, that, dri that individual's death would be attributed to alcohol. We don't keep those kinds of statistics related to marijuana use. Mm -hmm. So uh, an intoxicated driver due to marijuana who kills someone else, um, that doesn't go in as a marijuana death. Um, the heartbreaking case of the, the father who backed over his toddler after consuming um, a high THC marijuana uh, and killed him does not go into the records as a marijuana death. Where um, If he'd been drunk, it would have. If he'd been drunk, it would have. Uh, if yeah. someone falls down the stairs and goes to the emergency room, um, that's considered an, an alcohol uh, issue. We don't keep those records with regard to, to marijuana. So the direct costs in terms of, of injury and direct health, uh, we have not accounted for. And, and therefore, even trying to understand the indirect costs of this um, on our families and our communities is even more difficult to, to really tease out. Yeah. And uh, we're actually seeing that, aren't we, in states like Colorado, which is obviously just adjacent here to Nebraska, mm -hmm. where they have full legalization, essentially, Correct. right? I mean, right. I, I've read a stat that somebody dies in a marijuana related tra traffic accident every two and a half days in Colorado. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about yeah. the impact there? You know, public safety uh, with marijuana, especially with regard to impaired driving, is a really important concern. Uh, the American Automobile Association, AAA, um, uh, just released a, a report that shows that post-legalization the number of um, individuals involved in fatal crashes that tested positive for marijuana doubled. Um, and it's a bright line at the time of, of Washington State's uh, marijuana legalization. Um, what's even probably more frightening is uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics just released a press release. Uh, their survey data shows that 9% of kids um, ages 16 to 20, so that's one out of 10 of your high school kids, um, has driven while impaired. And where's this? Um, uh, the American just Association nationwide? of no, Pediatrics. Nationwide? Okay. Yeah. So kids who, who don't have legal access even in legal states are still obtaining marijuana and they're driving it impaired. Um, it's not just the issue, especially with, with young adults, of uh, being impaired while they're driving. Um, uh, another study published early this year um, demonstrated in a, in a simulator test that kids were 15% more likely um, to uh, engage in behaviors that would um, improve the likelihood of a crash even when they weren't smoking marijuana. So smoking marijuana impairs their driving performance even while sober um, and not under the influence of, of the drug. Just ponder for a second um, what it means. So how does that mean? Like, what, what do I, Okay, it, so I, I guess I'm not getting what you're saying with regard to they're not actually intoxicated with marijuana at the time, but it's still impairing their ability to, I mean, it's still leading to a, more, a higher likelihood of them having a crash? You bet. The, how does that work? The impact um, of delayed reaction times. Uh, just do the math regarding to how many feet per second you're traveling at 80 miles per hour going right. down, down the interstate. Fractions of a second in reaction time um, can... Uh, cause uh, increased rates of traffic accidents. We see that with distracted driving, texting and driving. Right. Um, youth in particular who are consumers of marijuana have such delayed reaction time, even when sober. Just in general. In general. sober. You bet. It increases their risk of uh, impaired driving and reduces their ability to perform in, in driving sim simulators. So we're conducting a gigantic experiment on youth, the, the effects of which will be um, lifelong for many of them. So, so these effects don't wear off after some point or we just don't know? The, we don't know, which is probably the most disturbing thing, but the tough thing about the brain, as we've learned from brain injuries and, and continued uh, research into to brain healing and repair, is the brain is not an, an organ which is particularly resilient once it's been damaged, damaged. or, or um, uh, traumatized. And the incorporation of, of THC in particular into neuronal tissue and its developmental delays, in some cases, can potentiate lifelong problems. So what are some of the other impacts that we 
we've seen with Colorado going to full legalization, whether it's on kids or anybody else, with regard to kind of just what happening, what's happening in Colorado. Yeah, um, with regard to, to full legalization, it's really difficult to get a, a full um, understanding of all of the effects, again, because we're not collecting a lot of, of really good data. Impaired driving is an issue. Um, childhood exposure, um, we're seeing an increased incident of children under the age of two reporting to emergency rooms for respiratory conditions that are tested positive for it, yeah. THC. So they've been exposed in the Wasn't home. Wasn't it like one in six or THC. something like that? Yeah, it's, it's an amazing uh, one in five statistic in, in wow. some of those uh, uh, kids. Um, we're seeing higher incidences of... Especially um, when you think of getting exposed in a secondhand smoke way, it's causing a a lung infection yeah. or whatever, but then it's also the impacts on the brain and, and right. impairing the brain development yeah. of that two-year-old. Secondhand smoke, breast milk, um, uh, accidental ingestion, these are all ways um, in which, uh, even though it is legal only for adults and not for children, uh, we see increased effects on, on children and families. Well, we also have the case of Levi Pongi who ate a marijuana cookie and then jumped off a balcony. You bet. I mean, you know, again, just a case of somebody who's young, who's actually, I suppose it was probably legal since he right. was legal to do it, but still ended tragically. And that's the, the frightening unpredictability of, of marijuana. Many uh, of those, uh, my vintage and older, uh, probably had some awareness of, of marijuana as a relatively benign kind of, of hippie drug. and. Um, probably knew someone who had smoked marijuana and it didn't really do much for them, didn't really have any effects. And they think it, that the marijuana produced in 2020 is that same benign kind of stuff that they maybe used in their youth. It's not that at all. This is no longer a, a drug, um, which is a low percent THC. So the, the, the stuff in the, in the 70s and 80s was two and a half percent THC, rose to about 5% you know, during my college years in the 90s. We're not talking about THC levels in bud and flower. That is 25, 28% THC. So one of the stats I read is that, again, and this would be kind of confirm what you're talking about, 10 to 50 times more powerful right. today than it was a few decades ago. Right. So when people were thinking about, oh, you know, I, I smoked pot and made me, you know, give me the munchies and mm -hmm. made me relaxed and blah, 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 blah. It's not the same thing anymore. Because no. No, not at all. these new, uh, I mean, it's an industry. Again, mm -hmm. it's a big industry, right? and they continue to develop their product and it's bioengineered to be a lot more potent, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is commercialization has led to um, highly bred strains to produce this high quantity of THC, and that's just in the raw product. So should, should, should they have to say GMO modified? <laughs> well, that, that gives right. an interesting uh, d debate. But, but, uh, but it is what they're doing, right? They're yeah. trying to modify the, the plant to be able to have higher you content, through, right? Through selective plant breeding, through greenhouse conditions, through fertilization. You know, they're growing these plants rapidly, very quickly with high THC content. And that's just the, the unprocessed bud and flower. That's not the highly processed forms where you see in edibles, in oils, in shakes, where you now have 85, 90% THC. Because you talked about like available. shatter and yeah. so I don't know. What's, explain so, what shatter is. So, what these are, these are products, um, and we won't go into too much details so we don't give any listeners a handbook, no. um, but these are, are ways in which the THC is Can actually extracted out and it's concentrated. So, in some of these, they're actually done at home on, on a black market, um, and others, they're commercially available, but the, the THC is, is very lipid soluble. So you extract it out of the plant and you can get a purified THC and it can be either ingested in a gummy. Many of these are, are packaged to be appealing to kids. Kids, right, yeah. Um, it can be uh, as a shatter in which it is uh, absorbed. Um, it's licked, it's eaten, it's consumed, uh, it can be smoked. And one thing we know about THC is that its negative side effects are dose and uh, dependent and frequency dependent. So if, if you consider that, that kid at the um, uh, concert in the 90s during the grunge era who, who smoked a joint, comparatively speaking to someone who's consuming a 95% gummy, you're talking about the difference between someone consuming a glass of wine versus a pint of grain alcohol in terms of the relative strength and potency. Um, it is, they're, they're uncomparable. If you drank um, a pint of grain alcohol, you'd be done. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. could kill you. And, and think about the dosages in, in a 95% THC gummy or, or other edible. Um, and, and that's what's led to uh, the identification in emergency rooms um, of uh, greater incidence of things like you referenced in the, the case of the suicide with uh, marijuana-induced psychoses, um, people showing up in emergency rooms with overdose symptoms, right. um, and all of the, the negative side effects that are magnified um, by this high dosage, high potency THC. This, this isn't 
using your your parents' uh, marijuana. This is a, a highly commercialized product that's intended for one purpose, and that's to get consumers addicted. Addicted, right? Mm -hmm. And then, well, there's a couple of different ways I want to uh, we can go on this. But one of the things that you, when you were talking about this, made me think of is Alec Berenson's book, mm -hmm. Tell Your Children, mm -hmm. and it's the truth about marijuana. And look, I know you've read the book. I've read mm -hmm. the book. Uh, it's kind of an interesting way it got started. Um, Alex was a New York Times reporter whose wife worked for the state of New York as a psychiatrist, I believe. Mm -hmm. And she came home one night and said, oh, guy killed his entire family high on marijuana again. And Alex's like, what do you mean high on marijuana? It makes you sleepy right. and amiable and gives you the munchies. And she's like, okay, well, I'm the one with a PhD, so I kind of know what I'm talking about, but why don't you go do your own research, smart mm -hmm. guy? And so he did, and he published this book based on his research where he was basically shocked to find out the mental health impacts, which we actually haven't really talked much right. about, but all the other impacts in this research and studies that have been showing around what the impacts of long-term exposure to marijuana are mm -hmm. and even the short-term exposure. I know you've read that book. You want, mm -hmm. What were some of the things that struck you out of that book? Yeah, I think what, what struck me the most in Berenson's work and his research uh, is the historical context in which he places that for centuries where where marijuana originated people knew um, it was bad yeah both in, <laughs> right? in, in mexico and yeah. in the indian subcontinent they've identified for centuries that there was in, in concentrated form even that marijuana plant and that marijuana use could lead to violence could lead to mental illness and it's for that reason that that the nation of mexico actually uh, implemented prohibition of marijuana in 1920 which was uh, over 15 years before prohibition uh, of marijuana and marijuana was made illegal in the United States. So there's a historical understanding of the role of that drug and how it's different than other plants, other psychotropics. But I think what really sticks out for me in Alex's work um, is the, the very challenging way in which we have to address this idea of, of causation and, and mental health and violence and crime around marijuana. And it's one of the reasons that over my time involved with this issue, I've become really passionate about helping people understand more about marijuana and what its public health and public policy impacts are. Because we have come so far over the last several decades in destigmatizing mental health issues. And along the way, we've also recognized from a policy perspective just how strained our mental health system right. is in this state and in this country. I'm guessing a week doesn't go by where something does not cross your desk or you're not involved in a meeting at the state level that's talking about access to mental health services, how we fund that, how we provide increased access. It is almost perverse that we have uh, done so much work to destigmatize mental health, but then with one policy change, we put a highly psychoactive commercialized substance that is known, and the side effects are well known, of psychosis, of paranoia, schizophrenia, um, schizo the, the trigger potentially for schizophrenia. And to put that out without regulation, to have this being uh, distributed to families and, and made accessible to kids by people who go by the term bud tender, who have uh, less education and training medically than a CNA does, who's not even allowed to distribute pills in the state of Nebraska to, in, in a nursing home. They're the ones... So uh, you're saying the people who are distributing in these dispensaries aren't, wouldn't even be allowed to distribute pills in a nursing home? No. They've they got so little training? Yeah, they have so little training. You know, Think about some of the debates that have ha happened here recently in, in the Nebraska legislature about um, licensing for reflexologists who simply manipulate your feet, your ears, and your fingers. Um, that, so they, they don't even have that kind of training. They don't have that kind of training. That's like 1,800 hours or something right. like that. Right, yeah. They they these have, people don't even have no, that. No, they don't even. Your med aide at a nursing home would have more training than the bud tenders who are sitting down with a patient who, let, let's, let's take the, the kind of classic poster person for, for medical marijuana use, and that's a, a, someone in um, undergoing cancer chemotherapy. They're not on just one drug. They're not on two drugs. They're on a multitude of drugs. Right. And when they see a healthcare provider, there's an entire team of individuals who are making sure they're not drug interactions, right. that everything that's given is going to be for the best advice of that patient. They and walk into go a dispensary, medical dispensary. Get, dispensary. And then there's going to be none of that, and that could totally Correct. throw off all the interactions on all the other drugs. Absolutely, which which led to a, a, a letter in the, the Journal of Cardiology, which said they've identified potentially 2 million patients on cardiovascular drugs in the United States are also regular users of marijuana. And there's known drug interactions between your statins, your blood pressure medications, um, the drugs that are used to treat arrhythmias and increase uh, the pumping and contractility of your heart. So 
we have people with no training um, using a psychoactive substance with no follow-up, no responsibility for what the side effects are for that individual. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. And you know, the risk of schizophrenia, it's rare. It's, it's less than 1% of the population. But if you're that individual, if you're that one, it's a life, it's a life sentence yeah. for you, for your family, for your community. I can't imagine any other substance, certainly no other thing that is promoted as medication that has that potential risk for lifelong debilitation and promoting mental illness that we would simply dismiss as, oh, it's a natural plant, so therefore it's safe it's and safe, harmless. Yeah. Yeah, that's not true. Not Just because it's a natural plant Correct. doesn't mean it's true. There's lots of poisons in the world. They're all natural. <laughs> They're all they natural. They were completely organic, and they still kill you. Absolutely. Right? I mean, so, I mean, that's just crazy to think, oh, just because it's natural, it's mm -hmm. safe. That's just crazy talk. So, uh, a couple things, uh, getting back to Berenson's book that I thought were really interesting is how we know that alcohol, alcoholism, mm -hmm. can lead to violent behavior. Marijuana use actually is can be in cases more likely to lead to violent behavior. Kind of getting back what you're talking about with the violence thing. Yeah, and and the the really frightening thing about marijuana use when it comes to psychotic issues, mental health, and especially the violence issue is its unpredictability in any given individual. Alcohol metabolizes the, the liver processes it at a fairly consistent rate and. Regular drinkers are going to have a, a faster way of processing that and maybe need to drink more to experience that. Um, but it's processed by the body and it, it leaves. Marijuana is completely different as a drug. Um, the way in which it's processed by the body is highly uh, individualized for each person. And depending upon the form that you take, the, the speed at which it absorbs into your body, the way in which it persists in your body. If you ever known someone who suddenly uh, had a, a big job interview or a, or a internship and they shaved their head, um, you can pull hair samples and identify THC for drug testing uh, months after someone has consumed it. This is a drug that its metabolites stay in your body for an extended period of time. So when you're, you're talking about an individual, especially with regard to violence, that individual may have used marijuana before and had no bad side effects, may not have experienced psychosis, mm -hmm. um, but then takes a different form, takes a higher concentration, um, uh, it interacts differently with other medications, and that's what leads to the psychosis and the violent behavior. It's incredibly unpredictable, unlike other drugs like alcohol, you, people are, are more of what they are. So they're a mean drunk, they're mm -hmm. a, a, a sad drunk. Um, marijuana users, depending on, on a wide variety of factors, have completely unpredictable outcomes uh, with each and every different high. Well, that kind of gets back to, I think you were talking about like on the Indian subcontinent, again, this is back in Berenson's book, kind of they knew that. Right. That this is one of the reasons why they're like, yeah, don't smoke marijuana because it can make, it can lead to, you know, people becoming yeah. really violent. You bet. And and so did, you know, both uh, um, Mexican tradition and um, Indian tradition was well aware of the potential effects and the link to violence, and it was culturally understood. And um, you know, the early prohibition was not necessarily against smoking the, the bud or the flowers, kind of the typical ganja uh, mm -hmm. in India, but was rather the more purified forms of THC. Which concentrated it. Which concentrated it. And now we're talking about bud and flowers which have THC concentrations that are several times over what those ancient preparations were in, in concentration. So um, the, the availability of, of really inexpensive um, and, and highly um, digestible and highly attractive forms of THC uh, is really the, the downside to this normalization. So and also, again, getting back to this idea that somehow this is supposed to be medicine, uh, People use it to self-treat for mm -hmm. mental health issues, and it actually can make it worse, right? Absolutely. If you've already got, if you if you already have mental health issues and you're smoking marijuana, that is likely to make those conditions worse. Yeah, and it's one of the most dangerous facts of, of self-medicating. You know, take for example, you had a someone who just every day when they come home from work, they've got a crack a beer or, or have a couple of, of shots of bourbon before they can sit down and spend time with their family, we would immediately recognize that as, as addictive behavior, right. as substance abuse. There would be no question that, that the individual who has to come home and, and consume a six pack of beer before uh, dinner with his family is, is abusing a substance. Yet we see commonly talked about, oh, I just need to smoke a joint to take the edge off, to calm down, to come down off of my high. And and there seems to be a disconnect in recognizing- yeah, That's addictive behavior too. Yeah, that's right? the same type. You've got type, a problem. If yeah, that's the case, you got a problem. Yeah, same type of right. substance abuse. And what I have seen over the last several years, particularly working with college students, is 
college students are notorious for self-medicating, whether that's with alcohol, whether that's with food. Um, I, I deal with and work with students who are, come from states and medical marijuana states who have a medical marijuana card for things like anxiety and sleeplessness. Which this can actually make worse. Which can make worse. And, and more than once, I've, I've had to sit down with a student who is unable to make it to their nine o'clock class, unable to, to achieve academically, and I start teasing out their issues. They'll talk about their anxiety and their sleeplessness, and then they'll say, oh, but you know, I'm, I'm consuming medical marijuana. I'm, I'm using my marijuana card. I'm consuming it to go to sleep at night. And, and as soon as they stop, um, their ability to get up, their ability to, their memory improves, their cognitive function improves. So um, we've sold this as benign and as, as helpful for conditions, especially with like anxiety and depression, which it has the ability to magnify. Also, we know in every other substance, those who are self-medicating for depression, for anxiety, for trauma, are the ones highest at risk for right. developing We don't approve that any other way. Right. Why would we do it for this? Absolutely. So it actually gets into one of the things, and you touched upon this a little bit earlier, this is an industry, mm -hmm. right? This is a, a big industry, just like any other industry. And my take on this is, this is an industry that's trying to sell this bill of goods, this false message, to avoid regulation. Right, right, because we regulate other types of drugs. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be regulated. Is that fair? Yeah, it, it's big business. So there's a, a reason why Altria, um, the the tobacco giant, invested over a billion dollars. Oh, they invest in, over a billion in dollars. Kronos, no uh, the publicly traded. Um, uh, marijuana company with an option for over a billion more to take another 10% wow. stake. So um, Altria has a 45% share in, in Kronos. Um, it's also the reason- So that's the overlap between big tobacco and big uh, yeah. marijuana. And, and Altria right? also spent, yeah, 12 billion to buy an interest in Juul. And- uh, Oh, the, we didn't even talk about yeah, vaping and the problems with that, right? Absolutely. We kind of know the problems that people are creating with vaping, and now there's yeah. an intersection between vaping and marijuana and too. And marijuana and THC, yeah. The, yeah. the um, rates of uh, youth vaping of THC have doubled. So in the, the youth behavior survey done in, in uh, Michigan, the highest increase of any risky behavior um, on record was last year, which was a doubling of the number of, of high school age youth who had vaped THC in the last 30 days. So um, uh, we're talking uh, almost a quarter of students had vaped THC in the last 30 days. Wow. The only time that that's been seen in, in any type of increase in risk-taking behavior was the year before, and that was with vaping of nicotine. So you can see the pathway in the playbook um, that, that big tobacco and other corporate interests, as they lose consumers on cigarette smoking because we've made it socially unacceptable and we've recognized right, we the We spent billions of dollars for, trying to get people to stop smoking exactly. because it's bad for you. And, and the, the harm reduction was vaping. And so now we have youth vaping nicotine, and we've recognized all the harms of vaping nicotine. And now we have legal THC, which has moved into the vaping space. And you can see the pathway. It, it, it is uh, something uh, any rational individual can, can see exactly where this leads. It's the same playbook that we saw with Big Tobacco, which is dismiss any scientific evidence which points out harm, get a generation of individuals addicted, and they do become addicted to the high potency THC, especially through vaping. Um, and then you have a consumer for life. Um, and keep moving through um, investing. The unfortunate thing is, the costs of this addiction, the costs of this, aren't going to be borne by the investors in those companies. It's not going to be borne by the people who are are paid to promote marijuana as medicine. It's going to be paid by families. It's going to be paid um, by individuals um, in terms of reduced health outcomes, um, in terms of their reduced productivity, um, and in society as general. The, the costs associated with marijuana commercialization and, and THC normalization and use um, are almost immeasurable. Yeah. So this is why you've gotten involved with Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you bet. Um, Sam is a, a national organization uh, here in Nebraska. We're a local affiliate. I'm a um, co-chair with uh, former Governor uh, Kay Orr, um, and we are uh, working both as an, an education and coalition building to help um, different segments of, of the Nebraska population, um, whether that's law enforcement, uh, healthcare providers, um, the prevention space, uh, educators, to uh, get facts about marijuana so and, and educate them um, and provide an exchange of information and the latest research. One of the really unfortunate myths about marijuana is that legalization is simply inevitable. You see lots of figures that are thrown around about uh, the, the public approval of marijuana, public approval of, of medical marijuana. 
what uh, we have found in, in our work is that Nebraskans are a pretty smart bunch, and uh, they don't have the same level of uh, approval um, of, of marijuana, um, certainly not for recreational, and they're suspicious of, of medical marijuana. We've also found that um, with a little bit of education, as many as 65% of supporters of medical marijuana legalization will withdraw their support with just a few basic facts yeah. that we've talked about Kind today. of the stuff we talked about yeah, today about absolutely. how dangerous it is. Yeah, right? the, the danger the, the role um, of bud tenders and the absence of physicians and pharmacists in this process. Um, how it's damaging to kids. Absolutely, the harm yeah. to kids, impaired driving. So um, fortunately, Nebraskans are, are really smart, and we have uh, good leadership. Obviously, your uh, leadership on this issue from the governor's office, um, uh, Attorney General Doug Peterson, um, the great leadership by uh, former congressman and, and Husker legend Tom Osborne. Right, he's against marijuana smoking. Absolutely. He saw this, he, I mean, he saw the impacts when he was coach, right? Yeah, and, and he has been... Uh, um, very outspoken about and, and very credible in helping Nebraskans recognize the impacts and the pitfalls of, of commercializing marijuana. And so we're fortunate in Nebraska that, that Nebraskans are, are smart and we're working hard to get the education and the information in the hands of as many Nebraskans as possible to make an informed decision. Great. Well, if somebody does want to learn more about marijuana, how would they find out more about what you've been talking about today? All this stuff, you've, you've sourced a lot of different studies, you've talked a lot of this stuff. If somebody wants to go out and do more research, how would they do it? Okay. Um, they can reach out to us directly um, on our uh, website, so samnebraska.org, and from there you can link to um, our Facebook page as well as our Twitter feed. So as a lot of these studies come up, and, and there are a lot of them recently, um, uh, we, we post them. We also, uh, they can sign up, be part of our mailing list, and, and receive information from us directly. Um, they can also go to learnaboutsam.org, which is the national um, uh, um, website, which has information to other partners, both on the national level as well as regionally. So lots of opportunities. We're also uh, engaged in a lot of different communities. We're working um, a, a lot with your local regions and prevention groups um, to get education out into the schools and into the communities. So if you're a parent, um, you want to know more, reach out to us and, and we can help get information um, either in your hands directly or get somebody in your community to provide that education. Yep, and we're trying to do the same thing in the state of Nebraska. Yep. We're trying to educate people about the dangers of marijuana. And uh, certainly there are Folks out there, I know in the community who want to help educate. If you're a healthcare provider and you're receiving grants from the state of Nebraska, you can educate people. It's not lobbying. Your grant's not going to be at risk. I want everybody to know that because I've heard some concerns about that. You can go out there and help educate, be a part of you know SAM or another group to be able to help under educate people about the risks of uh, marijuana and, and why that uh, you know rec you know any sort of legalization outside of the FDA would be a hugely bad idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've uh, kind of come to the end here. Anything else you want to say as we wrap up? You know, I uh, I think. It is really important that we preserve our investments that we've made here in Nebraska. We're, we're a cautious state, and uh, that caution is, is warranted. Most fiscally responsible state in the country? Yes, absolutely. Uh, along those lines? We've, we've made huge investments in our prescription drug monitoring program. We've made uh, move forward light years in our access to mental health. Um, we put a lot of investment in the education of our kids and in our families. Um, let's not step backward and undo all of that um, in, the, in the name of marijuana legalization. Um, and and resist the temptation that so many states have already done, um, which has gone down this path, not realizing the negative effects, and now they're playing catch up trying to, to mitigate the damage. Uh, we have the ability to, to prevent the, the issue from uh, continuing to rear its ugly head here in Nebraska. Great. Well, hey, thank you very much, John, for being on. I really appreciate it. I hope uh, our listeners will reach out and and uh, contact you or do their own research on this because this is likely to be a, an issue throughout this year. I don't know if it's gonna come back in the legislature, but I know there's people trying to make a ballot initiative out of it. So it's definitely important that people get educated about this year. Yep, absolutely, 2020. thank you. All right, great. Well, again, we've come to an end of another episode of the Nebraska Way. Thank you all very much as far as listeners uh, for tuning into this. I hope you enjoyed our very informative uh, speaker here today. John, thanks for being on with us. Uh, if you want to, uh, uh, please subscribe and give us a rating. If, you've subscribed, if you haven't subscribed yet, John, subscribe, give us a rating. You can also uh, follow us on Instagram, uh, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, uh, pete.ricketts at nebraska.gov. You can always send me an email that way. Uh, you know, those are a variety of different ways that people can get a hold of us. And I hope you all tune in next time for another episode of The Nebraska Way. Mm -hmm.